So I'm going to try to uh, give a bit of an overview um, on on some of the different related issues. Uh, my focus is a, is a little bit on the well, it is on the nitrogen side, uh, as is Laura and, and Ray. I know brings in a little bit more phosphorus. Um, I wanted to try to give a little background on uh, why we see some of the the nitrogen nitrogen related issues that we do uh, in the Upper Midwest, um, and and I think then that that uh, paves the way for, for Laura and Ray to talk about some of the things that we can do uh, specifically with some of the edge of field practices to reduce downstream, downstream nutrient loss. Um, so as we, as we think about the, the Mississippi River Basin uh, and the crop production uh, within the basin, you know, there is substantial demand for our agricultural products. Uh, despite some of the low prices, there's still very high demand. Uh, but there is increasing concern for local and regional waters uh, from, from you know, local drinking water supplies uh, to more larger municipality drinking water supplies, such as uh, Des Moines in, in central Iowa. And uh, then as we think a uh, larger scale, uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, hypoxia and the nutrient loading uh, into the Gulf. That led in, in 2008 for the hypoxia task force to develop a hypoxia action plan, which called for states to develop a comprehensive nitrogen and, redu nitrogen and phosphorus reduction strategies uh, for the, the 12 states that are, are members of the hypoxia task force. And that is as a result of those efforts to develop those uh, comprehensive strategies, there's been a increased focus on implementation of practices within the Mississippi uh, River Basin. Um, and uh, I think that, that fits in well with the presentations that we'll, we'll hear today about s some of what we can do. Um, just to kind of uh, back up uh, for those that maybe aren't familiar about uh, the load reduction goals that we're looking at uh, trying to achieve in the Mississippi River Basin. Um, the, the goal for the size of the hypoxic zone is to reduce the size of the zone to 5,000 square kilometers. You can see that's with uh, the black line there, uh, the task force goal. Um, the blue line is what is uh, the long-term average size of the zone um, uh, up until 2014. And so you can see we're close to uh, three times the goal in size, so about 15,000 or close to 15,000 square kilometers. So the, the size of the hypoxic zone in the summer is much larger than, than, um, than the goal in size. And so an EPA Science Advisory Board recommendation uh, was that to, to reach those goals for size, we need to reduce total riverine nitrogen and phosphorus loads by, by 45%. Uh, based on this, these state level uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, loss reduction strategies have really looked at what it would take and what what's needed to reach some of those 45 percent reduction goals and uh, some of our challenges as we think about the, specifically the upper midwestern area is that we're probably limited in how much gain we can make just within field nutrient management um, like so many things, it starts there, uh, but we are unlikely to be able to reach our goals of that 45% reduction with just uh, better infield nutrient management. And, I, and kind of one of the reasons for that, I think is illustrated by this, this graph. This is from a colleague, Dr. Mike Castellano, that's an environmental soil scientist in the Debar Department of Agronomy here at Iowa State. And that red line, illustrates the rate of soil nitrate production from native soil organic matter. So when our soils start to warm up, um, get some moisture in them in the spring, uh, we convert a portion of the native soil organic matter, organic nitrogen, into the nitrate form. We have uh, in some soils anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 pounds of organic nitrogen per acre of soil. And so a portion of that every year uh, converts into the nitrate form. But then we have the green line, the rate of corn or soybean nitrate uptake. And so as we compare those two lines, while the area underneath the curves might be fairly similar, we see that there's not a, um, the timing is not synchronous. We have that, that peak of that red curve before uh, the peak of the green curve. And as a result, we end up having a large gray area in the spring of the year uh, and, 
and a gray area even into the to the fall and winter as we start to look at where when we see excess precipitation across the corn belt we see a lot of that excess precipitation occurs in those periods uh, when we have that that gray area and so as a result even under the best nitrogen management practices we still have susceptibility and risk of nitrate loss uh, even on, as I said, under the best management of nitrogen uh, from a timing and, and rate standpoint. Uh, if we start thinking about maybe more diverse cropping rotations, we could envision that that red line and green line might match up a little closer in time-wise such that we have the potential to reduce uh, susceptibility of nitrate loss. And, and Laura talks a little about that with some of the different uh, cropping rotations. Um, not only do we have this challenge that uh, we have these or fairly organic rich soils, uh, but also the weather patterns are a big factor on why we see uh, some of the nitrate loss we do and why even under the best management we might see uh, high nitrate loss. Uh, this, this set of data follows through a 27 year summary from north central Iowa at our Gilmore City site. Uh, replicated drainage water quality plots where we measure how much water moves below the crop root zone and is captured by a tile line. And so that green, uh, the green set of, of symbols uh, and the connecting points uh, are showing the annual subsurface drainage um, from those plots. And so we can see in a year like 1993, we had significant rainfall we saw 27 inches of drainage in that year alone, whereas the following year, we only got one to two inches of drainage. As a result, our nitrate loss is very dependent upon that drainage that we get. Uh, you can see the red line there is the, the nitrate loss. On average, we're seeing nitrate loss of about 30 pounds per acre per year, but with a range of zero to 90. Uh, depending upon, the, probably the biggest factor, depending upon how much drainage we got, uh, which is a function of how much precipitation that we got. Certainly the nitrate concentration does vary. The, the blue line there is the flow weighted annual nitrate concentration uh, from those sets of plots. And so we can see a low in 1993 of about seven and a high of uh, in 2013 of about 21 or 22. So we see about a threefold difference in the in the concentrate the flow weighted annual nitrate concentration from that system. So one might ask, why does it vary so dramatically? And in this case, it's not based on the management uh, fertilizer management at that site. It's just based on the weather that we see, because during this whole 27 year period, this was a corn soybean rotation with essentially the same nitrogen management that whole time. We had an early spring side dress um, at 150 to 160 pounds of N per acre to that corn crop. And so what we see is in those early 90s, we had a lot of drainage, it tended to flush the system out. Uh, then if we look at a year like 2013 with that peak, that was a wet spring that was preceded by a very dry year with very little nitrate loss. So when we had that leaching in the spring of 2013, we saw how high nitrate concentrations. And we would be challenged to reduce that peak with just nitrogen management because some of the highest nitrate concentrations we saw were from plots that were in soybean in 2013. So they had followed that corn crop. Uh, so there was no nitrogen applied in the fall of 2012 or in the spring of 2013, and we still saw those very high nitrate concentrations. Uh, but what we could have done is implemented something like a cover crop there, and if we could get crop growth of that cover crop, we could help reduce that peak concentration that occurred, uh, and we did see some of that. Um, certainly, as, as we look at these systems uh, across the, the upper Midwest, the rate of nitrogen application does, does have an impact, um, but a couple aspects uh, to that, even when we apply no nitrogen, uh, we still see concentrations that might be from five to seven, five to eight uh, parts per million coming out the tile line. So, um, as we talked about before with that red line and the green line on the, on the mismatch of, of timing of nitrate in the soil profile and the, and the uptake of nitrate 
by the crop and the precipitation. I think that's kind of illustrated here that even when we apply no nitrogen to our corn soybean rotation, we still see concentrations coming out that tile line from, from kind of five to, to eight to nine uh, parts per million. And what, if we think about that, if we, if we look at what an average application rate might be in Iowa, um, which might be about 150, if we took the application rate from 150 down to zero, that's about a 40 to 50% nitrate reduction. So if we think of our goals of a 45% uh, nitrogen reduction uh, to the Mississippi River, with just nitrogen management, we'd have to almost go to no nitrogen application in a corn soybean rotation, which would certainly be of, of concern if we start to think about some of our soil, soil quality and soil health aspects. Um, and the, the previous graph really just illustrated uh, results from, from one site uh, with that curve uh, from our Gilmore City site in north central Iowa. As we worked on the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy, we wondered how well that, that generalized curve for one site um, would, uh, would, would represent uh, other sites and other locations. And so the, the curve that you see on this graph is all from this Gilmore City location in north central Iowa. Uh, the other symbols on there are data points from other uh, plot or small watershed scale studies done in, in central Iowa, northeast Iowa, or south central Minnesota. So similar geographic region, but not the same site, uh, but we do see it follows that same kind of general trend of, of increasing uh, nitrogen application, or as we increase nitrogen application rate, we do increase nitrate concentration. Uh, one of the things that we also see with that curve, it's, it's nonlinear. Uh, so if we have uh, producers that are, uh, you know, above whatever kind of the optimum end rate, which in Iowa might be 140 to 150 for corn following beans. And if we have somebody that's at 200 and they were to reduce down to 150, uh, there could pretty, be a pretty big benefit. But if you're at 160 or 170 and going to down to 150, a much less benefit. So some of those locations where maybe we have greater nitrogen application rate, they might be having a disproportionate impact uh, on the water quality that we see uh, in our streams. One other comment uh, is that from work that we've done in Iowa on drainage water quality, looking at commercial fertilizer and manure, uh, we do see similar nitrate losses, nitrate concentrations when we apply uh, manure at similar plant available nitrogen application rates as commercial fertilizer. We often uh, get that question in Iowa, um, isn't this just a, a manure problem? And if we're applying at similar, as I said, plant available nitrogen application rates, we see similar results in what's coming out our, our tile lines from our monitored studies. So as we look at uh, the nutrient reduction strategies or nutrient loss reduction strategies that have been done across the upper Midwest, I think the science is, is pretty clear that if we wanna reach the goals that have been set for 45% reductions, uh, we're gonna need kind of all available practices from in-field nitrogen management, nutrient management, if we think more broadly, uh, to both nitrogen and phosphorus. We need cropping practices and land use like cover crops, like maybe extended crop rotations, uh, like perennials, uh, whether that be pasture or some people are looking at dedicated perennial energy crops. And then we're gonna need some of the edge of field practices, which we will uh, will be talked uh, more about with uh, subsequent speakers. So with, with that, um, this is my uh, contact information should anybody want to, to get in touch.